Curtis instructor for this course, and this is the lecture for chapter 22, Electrostatics. Let's get started. So with this lecture, we're going to start entering a new uh, realm of physics called ENM, electricity and magnetism. But you're going to find that many of the concepts that we learned about when we were studying mechanics and thermal systems, they're going to apply to electrical systems. So just as we started out by first, you know, we looked at, we're studying our bodies in motion and we're looking at bodies that were at rest. And then we looked at bodies that were moving in motion. We're going to do the same thing with electricity and magnetism. So first we're going to look at uh, electricity that's at rest and then electricity that's in motion. Now that may sound strange, but just follow along with me. So electricity at rest, electrostatics is the study of electricity at rest. With electro for the electric charge that we're studying and rest, which is, you know, what static means. It means it's not moving or in particular, not flowing, because what we're going to look at with electricity is we're going to describe motion in terms of flow. So in the next chapter, we'll talk more about electric current, which is electric charge in motion or flow. Right now, we're just going to look at electrostatic. So this is the static charge that you see on electrically charged objects. And as I said before, we're taking the same approach here that we did with mechanics. So first, let's look at a little bit of history. It, static electricity has actually been known for a long time. Uh, the ancient Greeks were fond of using it as a party trick. Uh, they would take pieces of amber, like what you see here, and they would fashion them into rods, and they would rub them against cloths and generate a static charge, and it was a great party trick. And for a long time, that's really all static electricity was. It was a great party trick. But around the year 1600, an English scientist named William Gilbert made a careful study of static electricity. And as a result of publishing his experiments, he had to have a name for this phenomenon of electricity. And because it was just a new field of study at the time, he went back to the Greek and he called the electricity electricus, which is based on the Greek word electron. And electron means of amber or like amber. Well, that makes sense because that's what the Greeks were using to actually generate static electric charge, was rubbing up cloth against rods of amber. Now, other investigators later came along and laid the groundwork for electrostatics as we know it today. And probably one of the most influential of those was the French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb, and Coulomb established the foundation of electrostatics with his famous Coulomb's Law. What are we talking about? We're talking about electrostatics. Well, first, we need to talk about the most fundamental quantity that's underlying all full electrical phenomena, and that is charge. Electric charge can be positive or it can be negative. So, like charges repel each other, Unlike charges are going to attract each other. So, you know, it's like this opposites attract. That's that's what we got here. Positive and negative are going to be drawn to each other. But, you know, it's like if, if you get two positive charges, yeah, they don't they don't like each other. Because it's like, yeah, I'm happy. Oh, you're happy too. Well, okay, we don't really balance each other out. That's why the positive and the negative get together, because they balance each other out. Nature likes balance. Again, if you got like two negatives. You know, <laughs> it's like they're looking at each other. It's like, I don't want to be with you. You're depressing. Oh, yeah? Well, you're negative all the time. I don't want to be with you. So they just go away. They just, you know, just, just repel each other. I kind of like that in real life, too, actually, because i think of it. Anywho, charge is a quantity that is quantized. And what that means is that the charge is a whole number multiple of a set amount called a quanta. And that quanta is equal to the charge of a single proton if it's positive or a single electron if it's negative. So the charge of a single particle is a, is a quanta. And everything that has electric charge, the amount of charge that it has is a whole number multiple of the charge on a proton or the charge on an electron. That's, that's what we mean when we say it's quantized. 
The units of charge are coulombs, named after the French physicist who was so instrumental in laying the foundation for electrostatics. Now, just as we saw with conservation of energy and conservation of momentum, there's another principle called conservation of charge. Again, we see this theme of nature-loving balance running through everything. And just as conservation of energy and momentum are based on net quantities, yeah, it's going to be the same thing with the conservation of charge. We're going to get the net charge, and we're going to, you know, in order for everything to be in balance, the net charge has to be zero. Now, bodies can become positive or negative based on the transfer of negatively charged electrons. So, th there's no such thing as a positive charge being, you know, given or taken. It, we're, all, we're thinking about this in terms of where's the negative charge going? Okay, so when so we say something has a positive charge, what we're really saying is that there's a deficit of negative charge there. The positive char particles outnumber the negative particles. So that's what we mean when we say positive charge. Here's a great little video where they're looking at static electricity. And of course, they got that British accent again, so it's totally wonderful. And uh, yeah, so here, we've all seen the warnings at the gas station where it talks about how, uh, you know, how you're not supposed to use your cell phone because it could cause a fire, an explosion. Well... These guys actually test that theory out to see if it's really true or not, and that's part of what makes this video so great. So let's give a let's give a listen to this. Let it load up here. phone. The question is, do I answer it? I mean, we've all seen the signs. Do not use mobile phones, danger of explosion. Is there? I mean, if I answer this now, here, the whole place goes up in a fireball. Will it? No one knows why it's supposed to be dangerous to use mobile phones around petrol. The whole thing started when there was once an explosion at a filling station when someone was using their mobile phone. So, obviously, it had to be the phone that caused it. Now, the theories go maybe the battery caused a spark between the contacts on the bottom. Or maybe it was something to do with the electromagnetic radiation from the phone itself. Or maybe the bloke dropped his fag. Who knows? So let's find out. Now, if this is going to work, obviously it would be cruel to kill a car. So let's kill a caravan. <coughs> right, it stinks of petrol fumes in here. And uh, here's some more petrol. Should do. Here's the telephone. Don't ring me now, Mum, please. And uh, here we go. Right. <clears throat> here we go. Ready? Here we go. It's ringing. It's still ringing. Doesn't look like that's going to blow. Okay, that was poor. I reckon try more phones. If, as long as we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. If we've got six phones, is anybody's on vibrate? Because that would help. Yeah, that would yeah. I don't know. Okay. Okay. It might. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We know the numbers. We can dial them. I'm going in. <laughs> Nobody phone. It won't be funny, all right? Um, I'm going to have one there. One there. One there. <coughs> really smells in here. <coughs> and one there. <laughs> I'm getting out of there. Right. Numbers at the ready. Tell me when you've got your numbers in, don't press send. I'll do a three, two, one, and we go. But that's, so that's three, two, one, then go. Right. Okay, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one, send.
No, I don't think... I don't think that's working either, is it, really? No. Nothing. So, the mobile phone isn't going to blow up the petrol station. But we thought of something else that might. We've got a brainiac, some nylon clothes, a bucket, and a piece of wire. Why? Well, they do all these signs telling us about the dangers of using our mobile phones at petrol stations, but they don't say anything about the dangers of nylon clothes. You see, when synthetic fibres rub against our skin, we get a, a tingly sensation. That's caused by static. Static, of course, can generate a spark. Now, our Brainiac here is going to do some dancing in this bucket, in his nylon clothes, to generate that static. The bucket is here to stop him from being earthed, so that when he touches this fuse wire, the static will be transferred from him to the wire, down the wire, and blow up the caravan. That, at least, is the theory. Here we go. Dance. Generate that static electricity. Feel the charge build in those synthetic fibres. Not being earthed because of the bucket, that's what it's there for. We're going to go for it. Okay. Static generating brainiac. Okay, here we go. I've got the fuse. Are you ready? This is it. <laughs> that was your clothes! <laughs> That's astonishing. Good static. So, look out for the new sign at your local petrol station. Do not wear nylon whilst filling your car. been watching Brainiac Science Abuse. Yeah, so <laughs> you gotta love that explosion, right? I mean, that was just the best. I mean, that was the bomb. <laughs> I love it. And you gotta love the, the whole British accent thing. That's just, I can't get enough of that. It's just awesome. Yeah, so you can see it's a static charge was generated and that's why the guy was standing in the bucket because if he wasn't standing in the bucket all the charge that he generated most of it would have gone into the ground and so in order to keep that charge up and generated he was standing in the bucket to insulate him from the ground and uh yeah so like i said it was a great video uh love watching stuff blow up so that brings us to the concept of electric force now electric force is what holds the electrons around the nucleus of the atoms. It holds molecules together. Recall from chapter 11 when we talked about atoms, and the nature of matter, that atoms contain charged particles. So there's protons that have a positive charge. There's electrons that have a negative charge. And of course, the neutrons don't have any charge because they're really just a proton and electron put together. Electron forces operate similarly to gravitational forces, but there are three important differences that we need to recognize. The first is that electrical forces can repel or attract, but gravitational forces don't do that. It, there's no such thing as a repulsive gravitational force. Gravitational forces only attract, they do not repel. Electrical forces are usually much, much larger than gravitational forces. So we can generate magnitudes of electrical force that are much larger than those of gravitational forces. And last but not least, bodies can be shielded from electric forces, but not gravitational forces. There's no such thing as shielding from gravity. I get behind my gravity shield, then I'll be weightless. I mean, no, there's nothing like that. But there is such a thing as an electric shield. You can shield yourself from electric forces. And here's how that works. Electric charge is actually distributed across what's called an electric field. So gravity, just like gravity, had, there's a gravitational field but through which the force of gravity is transmitted. The force uh, electric, associated with electric charge is transmitted through uh, a, what's called an electric field. And so this is why we don't need to have physical contact in order to feel the effects of an electrical field. It's the same thing with gravity. You don't need to be touching anything in order to feel the effects of gravity. Uh, it works the same way. Uh, so because it's organized the same way gravity is, gravity, remember, force being a vector. So electric fields are transmitting force. So electric fields are also vectors. They have 
magnitude, and direction. The magnitude of the field is the force per unit charge. So in other words, we calculate the magnitude of the, of the force of the electric field uh, by taking the um, electric field and multiplying by the charge. Well, that's the same thing as if we want to get the value of the electric field, then that's just the force divided by the charge, or mathematical terms, E, which is the strength of the, the electric field, is equal to F, which is the magnitude of the force, and then divided by Q, and Q is what we use to represent the charge. The direction of that vector is the same as the direction of a small positive chest charge at rest would take if pushed by a force of the field. This is entirely conventional. So in order to develop the direction for our, our force vectors from an electric field, we simply adopted a convention. What would the direction of motion be for a small positive chest charge at rest and the field is acting on it? Well, Again, like charges repel, opposites attract, so it would move in the direction of a negative charge. So that's why a lot of this electric stuff that we're going to see, and you may have seen it already uh, in different uh, applications that you've come across in your life, the, the charge is always assigned to go from positive to negative. That's the way it works. So that's, that's just a convention. Now, we usually represent electric fields with what are called lines of force. And so if you got like a single point charge, you got lines that extend out from that single point charge, and they extend out to infinity. If you've got more than one charge, then the lines are going to extend from areas of positive charge to areas of negative charge. Notice the arrows on your lines of force. They're going from positive to negative. That's, again, that's, that's the convention. Now, the greater the distance between adjacent lines of force, the weaker the electric field in that region. So the electric lines of force that you see towards the center line, there in example B, those are going to be stronger than the ones that are out on the edge. So like the distance between the top and the bottom, notice how the spacing gets larger as you get away from that center, well, that means that the field is actually getting weaker as you go further out. So now that we've gone through some basic concepts with electric fields, go into your workbook, and I want you to work on an activity. Uh, you, you're going to see some pictures there of electric field lines that were revealed by pieces of thread suspended in oil. So the threads gain electric charge, and then they align themselves, these charged pieces of thread align themselves along electric lines of force. So we can actually see sort of a, a representation of the electric field lines itself. So the dark areas that you see there are going to be cross-sections of electrically charged conductors. So the charge is coming out from the conductor onto the thread. For each of these images there that you see in your workbook, I'd like you to identify whether the conductors are experiencing attraction to each other or repulsion from each other. Remember, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So look at the electric field lines, look at what they're doing, and see if you can determine whether the, the, uh, the, we're looking at like charges that are uh, repelling or opposite charges that are attracting each other. So go ahead, stop the video, take a look at that, and then when you get ready, come back, and we'll see how you did. All right, let's see how you did with this. So we've got four pairs to look at. So looking at the first pair, pair A, you've got your force lines there, and what we're looking at here is an area of attraction, equal but opposite charges. We know that they're attracting each other because you've got lines of force that are connecting the two conductors together. So that tells us that we're looking at attraction. We know the charges are equal and opposite because look at the pattern you make. If you were to like take a center line here and just imagine drawing a center line here, you'd have a mirror image on each side of that. And so it's symmetrical across that center line. And that's what tells us we've got equal charges, not just opposite. We know they're opposite because they're attracting, but 
there are also equal charges, and it's because of that symmetric pattern that we see there. For pair B that we see down here, we see the opposite going on. We see repulsion. Notice how the lines that are coming out, they don't connect the two connections together. They're actually coming up, and it's actually like, yeah, we're actually repelling each other. So where these are attracted, they're wanting to come together. These are repulsed, so they want to they want to push away from each other. That's what we see in the pattern here. Again, it's symmetrical. If you draw that same center line and you look, you see a mirror image of, of each side. So we know that the charges are equal, but they're not opposite. They're the same charges because we're repelling. Taking a look up here at pair C. So now we've got plates. These are just rods or spheres. Now we're looking at plates. So here we've got an example where we're attracting because we've got opposite charges and they're also equal charges. So if I look here, see the plates, notice how the lines are connecting the two together. And if I draw a center line here, it's a symmetric pattern. So that's another example of equal but opposite charges. And then last but not least, this, this picture down here where we're looking at a plate and then I guess this looks like a, like a pipe or a cylinder of some kind. So this is an example of attraction. They're equal but opposite charges. And we know that they're opposite charges because, again, you see lines of connection between the two. So that tells us we're attracting. And we know that it's equal because, yeah, I'm not going to draw a center line this way because if I do that, see this, this silhouette here is not reflected on the other side of that line here. But if I draw my center line up and down, see now what's on the left will mirror what's on the right with the shapes of the, the silhouettes of my conductors. And, you know, I see the same symmetry here with the lines that are being drawn, the electric lines of force that these threads are drawing out. So you've got equal and opposite charges again. So that's how you're looking at this for the electric field line. So keep this in mind. You might see this again in the future. Uh, so make sure you, you're aware of how to look at these pictures and be able to tell the difference there. This brings us to the concept of electric shielding. Okay, Remember we said there's no such thing as shielding from gravitational forces, but you can shield yourself from electric forces. Be and this is because electric fields are uh, you know, bidirectional. Gravity works in only one way. It only attracts. And that's why you can't shield against it. Electric fields, on the other hand, you can shield against it because electric fields can attract and repel. So it's possible to have a, a reaction, you know, built into the field itself so that it actually cancels out the effect, the effect of the field. And the way we do this is by using conducting material to form our shield. So if we encase something in a conductive material, like something that's metal, then the electric charge from whatever field's on the outside will distribute to the exterior surface such that the net charge inside the encasing is zero. And that means that no matter how large the field is outside, the net uh, field on the inside will always be zero. So looking at the different shapes that we have up here, you've got a sphere. So now notice how the charge is equal to the distance across the, the sphere. And that just makes sense if you want the net effect of this to actually cancel each other out. Here where you've got a square, or I guess maybe a cube, you've got charge that's ag ag collecting here along the corners. Okay, That might not seem to make that much sense, but if you approach this with uh, an eye to um, trigonometry, which is, of course, beyond the course of this course, you would find that that actually makes the most sense to make the net force of the electric field inside the object zero. Same thing with this egg shape. Okay, Notice how here where the egg is widest you've got the charge further apart but here on the other end where it's more narrow you've got more of these charges collected together. So you know how, whatever shape you have the electric charge uh, from the electric field is going to distribute on the surface so that the net force is zero. Nature loves balance, so it's all going to balance itself out. And this, it's this effect that creates a net zero 
feel inside the shielding. So as long as you're, you know, dealing with something that's made out of conductive material, you're going to be shielded from whatever strength of electric field you have on the outside. And that raises an interesting question. Suppose you're in your car and a huge bolt of lightning strikes your car while you are inside it. Will you fry or will you survive? You make the call. What is your decision? What will happen? Yeah, I'm hoping that you're saying something right now <laughs> and not just laughing. So, are you going to fry or are you going to survive? What's going to happen? Make your choice. Go ahead and say it out loud. Okay, I hope you made a choice, and I hope you said that you're going to survive because the exterior of the car is made of metal, and unless you're driving one of those old, what was it, the, uh, what was that, ah, uh, gosh, I can't even remember it now. It's like that old car that started the, um, God, what's his name, Ralph Nader, came famous when he wrote a book on safe at any speed way back in the 60s, and uh, it was about the, I think it was the Corvair? I can't remember the model of the car. It's escaping me right now. Anyway, car was entirely made of plastic. And <laughs> no, I mean, you know, unless you're driving something like that, because plastic's not necessarily going to conduct electricity that well. But most cars today are made out of metal. Yeah, you're going to encase yourself in a metal container. And so the metal conductive material, when the lightning strikes, you know, it's going to distribute the charge. The charge is going to be distributed equally around the exterior so whatever is inside, the net force, the net effect of that electric field on the inside is going to be zero. And so you're going to survive. And that's true of, you know, however great the electric field is outside the shielding, okay? The electric field inside the shielding will always be zero, as long as your shielding is made out of conductive material. This brings us to the concept of electric potential. So remember when we were studying mechanical systems, we had this concept of mechanical energy. And we used it to describe, you know, the position of a body in a gravitational field. That The height above the ground, you know, that's your position in the gravitational field. And that's what we used to describe the potential energy held uh, in a mechanical system. Well, there's a similar a parallel uh, concept in an electricity and magnetism and it's called electric potential energy and it's based on the position of your object in an electric field. It's often more convenient for us to deal with electric potential energy per unit charge and this is what we call electric potential. Now you may know this by a different name you may know this by the name of voltage, because we're measuring electric potential in volts. And the volt takes its name from another French scientist who was instrumental in laying the, the groundwork for this field of study. But electric potential is, is what we all call voltage, and those terms are interchangeable. So they're meaning that they're not talking about two different things. They're talking about the exact same thing. Voltage and electric potential, the same thing, measured in volts where one volt is one joule per coulomb. Capacitors are ways in which we can store electrical energy. So the work that's expended in charging the capacitors transformed into electric energy. So here you see a picture of an old time, uh, old time capacitor. And it's basically just a series of plates that you have spaced out one from the other. And those are the simplest types of capacitors. There's other ways to make capacitors, but this is the simple, simplest concept for a capacitor. You've got metal plates that are separated from each other. And essentially what you do is you hook it up to a power source, as you see up top, and the, and the uh, <clears throat> charge from the power source comes, and it charges the plates. And so you get one plate that has a negative charge, one plate that has a positive charge, because that's what your power source has, negative on one side, positive on the other. And so what ends up happening is you get an electric field generated between the plates uh, because of the, the charge difference there. So the, the connecting to a power source, you'll 
transfer the charge to the plates. The charge is going to line on the surface so that the net electric uh, charge is zero. And then the charging at charges will just continue to accumulate there on the plates until the potential difference across the plates equals the potential difference of the source. So there's a voltage for the source that's giving you the charge. When the voltage across the plates is the same, then that's when the charging stops. You can get a greater charge stored on the plates if you have a greater source voltage. Okay, and that just makes sense because you're keeping, you're going to keep charging the plates. The chains are going to keep accumulating charge until the voltages match. So a higher voltage means you're going to accumulate more charge on the plates. If you have a larger plate, you're going to get a greater charge because you've got more space to store more charge. So you'll get a greater charge with a larger plate. You'll also get a greater charge with closer plates. Now, we didn't go over this, but Coulomb's law says that um, the charge is actually inversely proportional to the distance between the two charges. And so um, that force that you generate, rather, uh, between the two charges is going to be inversely proportional. So the closer you get, the stronger the attraction. And so it just makes sense that the closer the plates are together, the more charges are going to be attracted to each other, the greater the charge is going to be on the plates. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you found it helpful. You can find uh, <clears throat> more videos there on Blackboard. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.